Now today we have our final sermon of our Lenten series, Letting Go. I titled this one, Letting Go of Idolatry. Now, uh, who knows what today is? Palm Sunday. We'll begin with the traditional Palm Sunday story, and then I want to offer a few insights into the story and hopefully a new perspective, a new way in which to understand what is happening on Palm Sunday as Jesus moves toward his death and subsequently toward resurrection. Now, here's the story of Palm Sunday in Mark chapter 1. As they approach Jerusalem, we're talking about Jesus and his disciples. This is the end for Jesus. Jesus, at this point, pretty much knows where things are moving. He's heading into Jerusalem knowing things, they might not end well here. He's entering into his final week before going to the cross. As all the disciples with Jesus approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. They stopped at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, which I love this, this is a funny detail in the story. Hey, if anyone asks you, what are you doing untying that colt? Just simply say, well, the Lord needs it. (laughs) So if anyone ever asks you, wait, why are you doing this? Well, the Lord needs me to do this. (laughs) Which can be abused as well. Now, what are you doing? Say, uh, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. We're going to borrow this colt for a time. These two disciples went on their mission. They found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, of course, some people standing there were like, hey, what are you doing untying that colt? That's our colt. You can't go and do that. And they answered just as Jesus had told them, well, the Lord needs it. We will bring it back. And so the people let them go. (laughs) I don't know why I find that funny. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road. At this point, Jesus is on the cult, and people, he's now moving into Jerusalem, through Jerusalem. People are throwing their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. The people know Jesus is coming. This potential, hopeful Messiah is coming. They throw their cloaks ahead of him. They wave these branches, all saying, those went ahead, they uh, followed, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning God save us. Jesus is entering on this cult, Palm Sunday. Everyone is there in the streets crying out, save us, save us. We need you to rescue us. We are placing all of our hope all of our dreams on you to be the long-awaited Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. What the Jewish people were looking for was a king like David, the great king of Israel. They were looking for another king to come and overthrow their Roman oppressors. They were looking for a king, for a Messiah, to come and reestablish Israel as its own powerful nation. They had been ruled by one foreign invader after the next. Long line of oppressors. The Romans were simply the ones who were oppressing them at this moment. What the people longed for is for Israel to be its own nation, no longer under the heavy boot of the Roman Empire. Jesus knows exactly what he is doing here in this moment. Essentially what's happening, this is street theater. Jesus has planned this. He is entering Jerusalem during Passover. What is Passover? It's a celebration of God overthrowing another evil empire. It's the celebration of the Israelites being rescued from Egypt. 
everyone is hyped up in this moment. You are celebrating being rescued and set free from an evil oppressor in the hopes that, what Jesus is doing here, in the hopes that God will do again what God did thousands of years ago. Jesus knows exactly how he is hyping the crowd up. And the crowd obviously knows how to respond. They have their cloaks ready. They're waving their branches. They are saying, save us, rescue us. What do you think the excitement level at this moment would have been? Where's the dial? Right here. All right, Keaton called it. He knew. (laughs) We are past 10 at this point. The excitement, you could just feel it in the air. Everyone is thinking this is the moment. God has been promising this for so long. We are going to experience this. Because everyone thought they would be a part of the generation when God would finally act. If you are alive in this moment at the street in Jerusalem, waving your branches, you're thinking, my goodness, the thing that my father and then grandfather, great-grandfather, the thing that they talked about, it's going to actually happen in my lifetime. And then I love what happens next. Jesus entered Jerusalem. He went into the temple courts. Everyone's thinking, he's going into the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. (laughs) he left he looked around all right i'm out of here i mean this story if you were there in the crowd you've been throwing you got rid of your cloak your favorite what's it dolce and gabbana cloak do they even make cloaks? I don't, I don't know. What's some designer cloak that you own? Think about the best cloak that you have. You are laying that down in front of Jesus because you think this is the king. He deserves everything. I'm willing to sacrifice everything. Now you've lost your cloak and Jesus has left. The palm branches that you had spent time cutting in the fields. All the time and energy that you invested in this. Jesus is here in this moment. It's about to go down. Jesus looks around, says, it's late Time for dinner. I need to hit the sack early. Got an early morning tomorrow. How do you think you would be feeling if you were here in the crowd? Angry? What'd you say? Cheated? Let down? Might be a little depressed? And spoiler alert, the week doesn't get any better. (laughs) We start on a downer And we just keep going down from there. So all the things that you just said, anger, being cheated, depressed, uh, everything. uh, Just imagine if you're here with your anger and it's only going to get greater. The depression is only going to feel even more overwhelming as the week progresses and ends with Jesus, this long-awaited hopeful Messiah on the cross. Here's what happens. We create our image, or we have our definition, we have our understanding of God. And we all have our own understanding. The person that you're sitting next to, as close as you might be to them, they have a little more nuance, they have a little different understanding of who God is than you. We all have a different view of God and how God acts. We all have, well, this is how God is supposed to act. And if I were to ask you, you could probably come up with the whole list of ways in which you expect that God would act. When there exists a gap between our understanding or our definition of God, our view of how we believe God should work, and our lived reality, all the things that we just mentioned— like disappointment, anger, being upset, depressed, feeling cheated, it all begins to set in because we have a gap in expectation and reality. The question I want to ask this morning, and as you can see behind me, I put a disclaimer in it, how do we combat this as much as possible? Because here's the truth. We will never come to a full understanding of God. 
We try. We can grow in that. Collectively together, I think works better than having an individual view, which is why we do community, why we have such a focus on community, because we realize, well, they've had this experience with God. That is so different than my experience, but I can learn about God, and I can actually expand my view of God by hearing how God has shown up in other people's lives. Or you hear someone else's perspective, and you think, wow, I never heard that before, but it kind of makes a little bit of sense. I can be open to understanding God in that way. Now, in order to answer this question of how do we combat the disappointment as much as possible, let's start early, early on in the story. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Remember, where we are in this point of the story is the Israelites have just been rescued from Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness. They are about to enter into the promised land. They are about to become a nation. God meets with Moses on Mount Sinai, offers these Ten Commandments, because these are to serve as the foundation for this new nation. What does it mean to be God's people? What does it mean to form a nation that serves the true living God? And here's how these Ten Commandments begin. God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, Let's look at this second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. In the ancient world at this time, every nation had their image, their idol of the God that they followed. You might carry that idol around with you, sort of like a lucky rabbit's foot. Maybe you would have an image of this God carved into stone or carved in wood. You would keep it at the temple because it was believed that that idol, that image served as that God's presence. So let's just say we followed the God of movies. So we would have an Oscar probably, right? Now imagine if every single time that we held service, we put that idol or we put that Oscar right here. We would then be saying, we are following the God of movies, and that God's presence is now here with us. God is offering a completely different way in which to do religion. You shall not make an image of me. You shall not carve an idol and carry it around with you. Let me show you why. Uh, here's a picture, and I noticed as I put this picture together, I'm wearing the same pants today that I had in this one, <laughs> this was the first COVID sermon that I recorded. I, I don't know why. I just decided to choose this picture. I could have taken any picture in my camera roll. Here's the thing about a picture. A picture is frozen in time. You look at this image. There's some things that you would be able to gather from looking at this image. You could say, oh, there's Dave. He's sitting at his table. Didn't really do his hair that well that day. He's wearing the same pants. That's what the kitchen table looks like. You could come up with all these different ideas and things that you understand from the picture. But what would be missing? Some of the context for this. If I didn't tell you what was going on here, you'd have no idea what I was doing. Why is he sitting at that table? What is he looking at? What's he holding in his hand? What is that book that's over there on the side? Because a picture is frozen in time. A picture is 2D. But we exist in a three-dimensional world. We talked about maybe a four-dimensional world. You want to include time in that. A picture is flat. Here's what happens. God can't be captured or contained in an image or in an idol. Because then, like that picture... God becomes frozen in time. We have an image. We have an idol. We say, this is who God is. This is what God looks like. But we're missing larger context. We're missing the aliveness of God. As soon as you capture something down, it, begun, it begins to lose some of its depth. And God is saying, I am deeper I am more mysterious. 
I am beyond your understanding. And if you think that you can contain who I am in an idol and then carry that image around with you and say, here's our God, here's what our God looks like, you're missing the point. Because God is a dynamic being. All these other gods, they were a bit more static, a bit more flat. And God's saying, I, I know what you think it means to be a religion or to follow a particular God, but I am way bigger than your understanding of the divine. You think you can capture your gods in an idol or in a carving, but those gods, they're, they're not the true living gods. I'm bigger, broader, and deeper than all those gods. So right from the beginning of the story, we have God telling his people, telling the Israelites, you cannot pin me down. No matter how much we might try, God cannot be pinned down. I was reading, uh, who's read Wrinkle in Time? The author Madeline Langle, uh, she wrote a bunch of other books, which I had no idea about, reading one of her other books a couple of months ago. I came across her translation of Psalm 5012. She translates it this way. This is God speaking to the Israelites. You thought wickedly that I am like you, but I will reprove you. There's a great saying, we shape our gods and our gods shape us. We come up with our understanding of who God is and then that understanding that we came up with, it continues to shape who we are and how we act with others. And here's what happens when we do that. We say, well, the God that I follow, the God that we follow, happens to think like us. The God that we shape happens to look like us, to hate the people that we hate, to favor the people that we favor, to act in the ways in which we understand God to act, and to disagree with all those who we disagree with. And unfortunately, this way of being, shaping our gods, and then having that view continue to shape us, well, we can use God to then justify all sorts of evil acts. Well, I'm just doing what God wants me to do. And we don't even know this happens. This happens under the surface. And we can have the best intentions, and I'm sure we all do, the best intentions of following God and trying to understand God, but in reality, we are human. We're fallible. Any definition or understanding that we could ever come up with about who God is will eventually fall short. We shape our gods. Our gods shape us. I have a great friend, and he says, Dave, we're all wrong about God somewhere. The problem is, we don't know where we're wrong. Because we're not wrong. They're wrong. Oh, you hold that view about, and I hold this view? Well, you must be wrong because my God looks like this, and that's very different than your God. We shape our gods. Our gods shape us. Think back to early in the story. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below because you cannot pin God down. Now, there's some things that we know to be true about God. Of course there are. We read these things in the Bible. We look at the life of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and we can know who God is through the life of Jesus. So we can say that God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God is a God of forgiveness, freedom, setting us free from the things that hold us in bondage. God is a God of resurrection, of new life, new beginnings. That's what we are celebrating here in this season. It's the central part of our Christian faith. The things that we thought were dead and gone are being brought back to life, possibly in a new way, or the things in our lives, we put them to death, the sin we put to death, and God offers freedom and grace and forgiveness to pick up and begin again. We don't have to be held down 
by the things that we find shameful in our past. We know that God is a God of mercy. God is a God of sacrifice, of giving, without expecting something in return. We know that God is against violence and death and hatred. So there are some things that we can say with certainty about who God is and how God acts, but then there's a whole mystery to God that we can never figure out, which is why we can't pin God down. Here's this great story in John chapter 3. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. To which Nicodemus is like, What? How can someone be born when they are old? What in the world are you talking about, Jesus? Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. To which Jesus is like, You're totally missing the point. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. It was a windy night last night. You look out, you could see the trees moving. But you, you couldn't see the wind. And the trees would blow this way, they'd blow that way. I mean, sometimes the wind, it comes from the west. Sometimes it comes from the east, sometimes from the north. The, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You might be in the back and you feel the breeze, you feel the, the wind blowing on your back, but then all of a sudden the wind can shift and the wind can come right at your face. The wind blows wherever it pleases. There's a mystery to it. There, there's this way of being that transcends our understanding the spirit god it's like the wind we don't know why sometimes you feel like you pray and you pray and you get an answer you feel like your prayer has been answered well then other times you pray and you pray and you pray the exact same way you make sure you're facing the sun, the direct angle. Like you have all these superstitions. Well, I prayed this way last time and God answered it. So I, I must pray the exact same way this time because that must mean that God's going to answer it again the way in which I want God to answer this prayer. But your prayers go unanswered. It feels like your prayers are going or falling on deaf ears. There's a mystery to the whole thing. Why do some prayers seem to get answered, but other prayers seem to go unanswered. Why, why does God appear to act this way sometimes, but then other times, months later, weeks later, very similar situation, and it feels like God is absent. Jesus is like, hey, the, the whole realm of faith, God, it's like the wind. It blows this way for a time, for a season, and then it changes direction. And you have no idea which direction the wind is is blowing. There are some things that we can know for sure about God. Qualities of God that we just looked at, but then there's this whole mystery to the thing about how God acts, how God relates to us, how God follows through that we just can't understand. You cannot tell where the wind comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asks, well, how can this be? And here's Jesus' response. You are Israel's teacher? <laughs> You're in the know? And you do not understand these things? You, you're up at the top. You're being paid for people, you're, you're being paid to give answers to the people's questions. And you don't understand this about God? <laughs> like, hold on a second here. You're the Bible answer man, the Torah answer man. And yet, you're lacking this, to Jesus, this basic understanding about God, that God's spirit's like the wind. Sometimes it blows from this direction, other times it blows from this other direction. Jesus essentially is saying, God defies our intellectual 
understanding. Nicodemus thinks, well, if I just go to Jesus, he's going to give me these answers. He's going to give me the five things to know and believe about God, because obviously he's a religious man. He's in with God. So if I go to him, he's going to show me the things that I'm lacking. But Jesus just goes and blows the whole thing up and creates even more mystery for Nicodemus. Because God defies our intellectual understanding. We have our points about who God is, but then all of a sudden something happens and our understanding of God becomes shattered. We have our five points. I took systematic theology in seminary. We have our systems. We have our theologies. And God has to act within that box. But then you go through life and you realize God acts outside of that box. And the box that you've created for understanding the divine, it becomes broken and shattered because God is like the wind. Here we are today. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts, Everyone was expecting God to act in this moment. Jesus looks around and goes home. Disappointment. Wait a second. This isn't how God was supposed to act. Everything was set up properly. Savior coming from Mount of Olives, which was a prophecy from the Old Testament times. The Messiah riding on a colt, another prophecy coming during Passover. Everything lined up perfectly. Of course, this is how God acts. Jesus looks around, leaves, a week later is killed on a cross. Three questions for us. Do you have any disappointment with God for not acting how you expect God to act? Are you holding in your heart today any disappointment with God? You had this view this understanding, you've shaped your God, you've carved your idol, you have your image, and God is not being faithful to the image that you have created. You have your box, but God is not playing by the rules. You find yourself here this morning, carrying some disappointment. Second question. Are there any ways you've turned the living God into an image frozen in time? Like a butterfly, have you pinned God's wings down? And God's like, no, I'm not going to do that. No. No. Uh Uh-uh. No, I'm not going to act that way. uh, Third question. Have you found yourself trying to wrap your head around God through your intellect. Yeah, we do this all the time. We have our definitions. We have our words. What's the movement in Scripture? Word to flesh. Words can only carry you so far. Theology can only carry you so far. Definitions can only carry you so far. Are there any ways in which you have been trying to understand God through intellect alone? Came across this quote the other week. Absolutely love it. It's from the scholar Dale Allison Jr. in his book, The Resurrection of Jesus. God is no more in the argument than in the earthquake, a story we looked at last week. God is in the experience. God is in the experience. Not in the words that we create to understand God, but God is in the present moment. God is with you right now in the midst of whatever you find yourself going through, leading you forward into all those qualities that we just looked at a few minutes ago. How we get there, that can be a bit of a mystery, but God is in the experience, not in a word or an image. So the way to letting go of idolatry is to focus on what you know to be true of God. And then you allow that image to become true in you. We can know with certainty that God is a God of love. God is a God of grace, of forgiveness, freedom, 
resurrection, mercy, sacrifice. We know that God is against violence, death, and hatred. How do we let go of idolatry? We focus on the qualities of God that we know to be true. As we focus on those, they become more inherent to who we are. As we focus on the truths of God that we know, not the mysteries that we can't understand, we begin to open our hearts a little more to this mysterious God who is with us in every moment. And instead of shaping our gods, which we all do it, it happens no matter what, we allow God to shape us a little bit more than we shape God, which that's always what you're looking for, that we would be shaped downward, God shaping us rather than us shaping the divine. And I love this verse because whenever theology fails, whenever intellect fails, whenever you're left wondering, what in the world do I believe about God? Because sometimes we all go through those moments where it feels like we don't know anything about God because God shatters our expectations or works outside of the box and we're left trying to pick up the pieces saying, what can I possibly know is true about God? Here's a verse for you. First John chapter 4. Dear friends, here's a pastor speaking. Friends, awaken. Church, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. How do you know God? It's not through arguing with other people about what God looks like. It's not through your intellect. It's through experiencing love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We let go of idolatry by focusing on the experience that we have with God. Experiences of love, grace, and all the other qualities, the things that we know to be true about God. So this season, let's set aside the intellect. Let's set aside the images, the idols, the frozen pictures and understandings that we have of God. Let's set aside all the ways that we try to pin God down. And instead, let's open our hearts to the mystery of who God is. And let's focus on love. Because if you want to understand and know God more, we learn right here, you'll know more about God the more you open your heart to love. The more experiences with love that you have, receiving love, offering love to others, that's how you grow in your understanding of God.